Hello. This video will serve as an introduction to working with twin data using R and OpenMX. As you get started with this video, you may want to download three files to your computer or server folder. They can be found at the following address for the workshop. So by the time we finish this video, I hope that you'll be able to recognize some of the major steps involved in an OpenMX model and be able to see how a simple linear regression can be conducted in R and also in OpenMX. So what is OpenMX? Well, it is a package that can be used in R for the estimation of advanced multivariate statistical models through structural equation modeling. It produces the models using path or matrix specification. So how does OpenMX work? OpenMX uses several functions to build objects, and those objects are then used to produce matrices, define matrices, do matrix algebra, and produce the models that we're interested in testing. All of the arguments in the functions in OpenMX do have an order, and the order can be changed by naming arguments. There are a couple of data preparation considerations that you should keep in mind, particularly as you're working with twin and family data. In particular, the algebra style that's used in OpenMX when working with twin or family data expects one line per case or family or twin pair. Therefore, you have an almost limitless number of families that can be used, as well as variables. Another thing to remember is that the data needs to be read into R before it can be analyzed in OpenMX, and it is fine for R commands to be nested within the R script. Finally, as with R, the default value for missing is NA in OpenMX. And since we're talking about matrix algebra, it's time to take a quick detour into the fundamental calculations of matrix algebra that will be most frequently used in analyses of twin data using structural equation models. Each of the next slides offers an example of matrix algebra calculations and matrices that will be used in OpenMX. As we've discussed before, OpenMX functions on the foundation of matrices and matrix algebra. And so we're going to do a very brief review of matrices and matrix algebra, as well as the types of matrices that are often used in OpenMX. Here, we offer a very brief summary to orient you to matrices. We have a matrix A that has three rows and two columns. Generally, we discuss matrices in terms of rows first, and then columns. Therefore, we would describe matrix A as being a three by two matrix. If you want to identify a specific element within the matrix, you can simply refer to its location in the matrix. For example, the number four is located in the first row and second column. Or in other words, the number four is in element one, two within matrix A. OpenMX uses specific types of matrices and defines those matrices by type as we have identified here. So you have different types of matrices and all the specific names for those matrices have been identified as type equals on this list. So for example, a zero matrix as identified here, is a matrix with all zeros in every cell. This particular matrix has two rows and three columns as identified by n rows equals two and n call equals three. Additionally, matrices will be named. And in this case, this matrix has a name called A. You as a user will define the name of the matrix yourself, and it can be whatever you'd like it to be. It doesn't have to be a single letter. So as another example, we have a unit matrix that consists of all ones and an identity matrix that has all ones down the diagonal path. We have what we call a diag matrix. This is a diagonal matrix where we are also estimating this matrix to have three rows and three columns, and we're defining this to be free equals true meaning that there are some cells that we want to make estimable. And we will see what is actually going to be estimated as these question marks across the diagonal. 
So the other cells in the off diagonals will be fixed to zero. But OpenMX understands that is meant to estimate the values within the diagonal. Similarly, you have matrices like S diag, which are estimating the off diagonals. Stand represents a matrix where we are estimating both sides of the off diagonals and also fixing that the diagonal to be equal to one. Symmetric or sim refers to a symmetric matrix where all of the cells are estimated in the matrix, but it is expected that the estimates from the lower part of the matrix is going to be estimated to be symmetric to that of the upper portion of the matrix. Lower refers to a lower matrix where only the lower part of the matrix, including the diagonal, is estimated. And we also have full or a full matrix where all of the cells of the matrix will be estimated. So now that we've identified some of the matrices, let's talk about matrix operations that are often used in OpenMX. This is a very brief list, and there are more matrix operations that can be conducted in OpenMX. If you're interested in learning about the other operations, I would suggest that you refer to the OpenMX website or your OpenMX reference material for more information. Another thing you should keep in mind is that each one of the following slides will contain examples of how to conduct this matrix algebra. So you can practice these with pencil and paper. We will not go into detail about the calculations for each, but we will provide examples for you to try on your own. Here, we have an example of matrix addition and subtraction, and we have identified those here as just plus and minus symbols. So the most important feature here for matrix addition and subtraction is that it's a cell by cell function. OpenMX also has a dot product, which is understood to be an element wise product. And that is denoted as the asterisk symbol. OpenMX implements also matrix multiplication using the percent star percent symbol as denoted here. Another frequently used matrix algebra function is the Kronecker product. And that is denoted by the OpenMX symbol of percent x percent. Finally, the quadratic product is often used and can be extremely useful for statistical analyses across multiple matrices as identified here. And the OpenMX symbol for conducting quadratic products is percent and percent percent. Now that you have the basic features of OpenMX and the basic building blocks, we're now going to turn to trying our hand at using OpenMX to conduct a linear regression. In the linear regression that we're going to do, we're really just trying to see if there is a relationship between study site and weight for all twin one members of twin pairs. But before we get going with an open MX linear regression, we're actually going to conduct a linear regression using the LM function in R. This would be considered a standard approach. It wouldn't require the use of any kind of structural equation modeling. And so when we try it out with something that's more comfortable, we're trying to get our feet wet so that we can then test it out against an open MX approach. So if you have your code downloaded, you want to look around line 41. And we have that code identified here on the slide, and you can run it uh, on your own computer. And once you run it, you'll be calculating that relationship between site and weight and producing the estimates of the intercept, theta, and the variance. We have also listed the estimates that resulted from our run. Your estimates may look slightly different, but not much different from what we have here. So how will this compare against OpenMX? Or how do we even start thinking about beginning to translate this into OpenMX space? It's probably good to take a pause and move into linear regression by thinking about the building blocks underlying a basic linear regression. Here, we have a typical regression model equation. Weight equals beta naught plus beta one, site one plus an error term epsilon. If you break it down, it represents the average contribution of site on the average contribution of weight across all observations in a sample. So for example, in this first line, the first observation of weight is observed as y1, and it's equal to beta naught or the intercept plus the effect of sight for that first observation 
as beta one X one, and it will have an error term related to it. And for each observation in your sample, you would have a similar equation and you would average across all of those equations. But how is this conducted in practice under the hood? Really, it's conducted by a series of matrices to make its work using these large data sets. And so what ends up happening is that you use four matrices to conduct this work. One has the outcome, another has the beta naught estimate and the beta one estimate of the intercept and the regression on site. Another contains the fixed observed variable site, as well as that estimate of that influence on site. And a final matrix contains the error term. Digging a little bit deeper, if we really were to think about this as a generalized problem, we would have those four matrices to reflect the following vectors. So matrix Y would be considered an N by one column vector. X would be considered an N by two matrix. Beta would be considered a two by one column vector. And epsilon would be considered an N by one column vector. When you actually conduct the regression, it would be conducted in the following ways. First, the term beta x will be calculated using matrix multiplication. And then the addition across the entire model of beta x plus epsilon will be calculated using matrix addition. So what we can see here is that we already have, and we have already been working extensively with matrices, even in linear regression. And so now we're going to translate that logic over to OpenMX and reconduct the regression in OpenMX. You use the same file that you previously downloaded for the linear regression code using R. And if you were to look at the code beginning on line 52 and run the code from lines 52 to 121 using an OpenMX approach, you would find that you would have intercept values and beta values and beta one values, as well as the variance to be similar to what we have here. And if you compare against what had been calculated using the LM function, you'll find that the values would be quite similar, which is great. But just because we saw the answers doesn't mean that we really understand what happened here. So I'm going to take a moment to scroll through our code to see if we can dig in a little bit deeper and understand what's happening under the hood as it applies to the OpenMX code. So how did we actually get the model to work in OpenMX? If you scroll to line 61 in the code, you will see several lines of code that match what you see on this screen. Here we have translated our path diagram figure to a structural equation model that uses matrix algebra. One note to mention is that in many ways, OpenMX has its own specific language conventions for use in R. And as such, it is necessary to become familiar with some of the functions that are specific to OpenMX. First, we define several MX matrices for use in OpenMX. It should be noted that although it is possible to produce matrices in R, OpenMX will not recognize them. You must produce an OpenMX matrix using the MX matrix function for use in OpenMX models. We have four matrices whose information is contained within four R objects. The R object EVAR contains a matrix named residual VAR that represents the residual variance of weight. We know the name of the matrix because it is identified as name equals residual var. This matrix contains one row and one column and is an estimate of the parameter that will be estimated because it is being requested using the term free equals true. This matrix also contains a starting value of 10. A starting value is a value that contains a, a number that the data analyst provides to give the OpenMX optimizer 
a value that is close to, but not the same as the expected value of the parameter estimated. Here we use the value of 10. You could try it out yourself and put a different value. You may see some changes in your estimate, but not much. The one cell in the one by one matrix residual bar has an internal label of var t1. The R object B0 contains the matrix called intercept, which represents the intercept of weight. This matrix has one row and one column. The cell of this matrix is labeled as beta 0 T1. The R object B1 contains the matrix called B site, which represents the influence of site on weight. This matrix has one row and one column. The cell of this matrix is labeled as beta 1 T1. The R object X contains the matrix called site, which represents the observed value of site for each, for each observation. The cell of this matrix is labeled as data dot site underscore T1. If you scroll down a little bit further to around line 80, we're sharing additional code here that was used to produce the regression model. So the object exp mean takes the previously defined matrices of intercept, B site, and site to conduct the regression using an MX algebra term. MX algebras are functions that will take previously identified MX matrices and actually do the math to conduct the models that you're interested in putting together. The results from this MX algebra are contained within the object exp mean. The next piece of code is specifying where the data come from. The object reg data tells OpenMX what object contains the data, which is twins 2a underscore one, and that it's raw data rather than covariance data or some other form of summarized data. Additionally, the object that's called inclusions lists the object names that were previously referenced into the model. Remember that these are object names to be included, not matrix names. The object exp calls up the results of the algebra that we conducted as arguments for the expectation function, and the dim names map the data to the model. It should be noted here that the, that the matrix names defined in the MX matrix function are the statements that are used here. So you are not using object names. The line where you have an object called fun and ML declares the fit function that the model will be using to conduct and estimate to use maximum likelihood. And when combined with raw data, this means that full information likelihood will be used to optimize this model. Finally, you're going to build the model using the objects reg model and reg fit to specify the name of the model, the objects that were previously referenced, and the data. Once you finish running the model, you'll want to take a look at those results. So the object called reg fit actually contains all the results from the model. And you can run the function summary around that object to take a look at the summary of those results. And in this case, we're passing it to an object called regsum. You can always dig into the object itself and look specifically across a wider range of results that are contained within that object. But the summary statement allows you to take a brief overview to see what's happening. This slide summarizes the various objects from the model we just ran and their roles. This slide can be revisited for use as a reference to serve as a roadmap when you're running other OpenMX models to remember what each function does. So if we were to expand our work now to run the linear regression from one twin member of a pair to actually using two members of a twin pair, we could work it out. Here, you will run the code beginning around line 176. 
This section begins with the title Second Open MX Model at a code twin. Once you run that code, you will produce results that look something like this. And if we were to dig a little deeper and go through that code around line 184, we would get more detail about what actually happened to produce those results. Here, we are explicitly including the effects of sight on the mean of the object weight separately for each twin. So in this instance, we have a one by two matrix for each member of the twin pair. If you compare that with the one that we had done previously, this X matrix was a one by one matrix because it only contained one member of the twin pair or twin one. Additionally, I want to bring to your attention the object EVAR because now this object variance doesn't contain the variance for one member of a twin pair. It contains the variance for both members of the twin pair estimated as var t1 for twin one and var t2 as a variance for twin two. But we also include the covariance that is shared between the twins as cov t1 two. We added some additional starting values to this matrix to account for the starting values for each of the variances of the twins, as well as the covariance between twin one and twin two. We have a figure representation of what's happening here on the left-hand side. You'll also note that you have beta zero T1 and beta zero T2, because again, you are conducting a regression in both twin members of your pair. So instead of a single beta zero, you now have two for your intercept. Similarly, you have an object X, which contains the observed variables for sight in twin one and twin two. So now that we've taken a very brief tour around OpenMX and we've conducted our first regressions with OpenMX using twin data, I would suggest that you take that code, test it out and identify any questions that arise. Because OpenMX is super powerful, it allows for considerable user flexibility and that, that allows you to test all different kinds of models. However, learning the OpenMX language can initially be overwhelming and a complete understanding of OpenMX is not at all expected at this stage. So we urge you to share your questions. Please share those questions with us so that we can help you and make your learning more efficient. And with that, I thank you and hope you have fun as you run your first OpenMX models.